to Notable Nobels, a podcast about the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. My name is Harrison Doolin. I am a PhD candidate at the University of California, Riverside, and I will be your host for this web series. The purpose of this series is to trace key advancements made in the biological and medical sciences over the past 120 years or so, and we're using the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine as a guide. Now, every career has its highest prize, and the highest prize for a scientist is the Nobel Prize. Now, I have started every episode of this podcast so far by saying the Nobel Prize marks discoveries that have made a profound impact on our understanding of human biology and ability to treat diseases. Well, today's prize is an exception. We will be examining the 1926 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, which was awarded to Johannes Andreas Fibiger. The Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute chose to give Fibiger the award, quote, for his discovery of the Spiroptera carcinoma, unquote. Erling Norby, who has served as a member of the board of the Nobel Foundation, has referred to this decision as, quote, one of the biggest blunders made by the Karolinska Institute, unquote. We will be going over Fibiger's discovery of a roundworm he claimed caused cancer, how that claim was later shown to be false, and end with a discussion about reproducibility in science. But first, a little bit about the recipient's background. Johannes Fibiger was born in Denmark in 1867. His father was a local physician, and the importance of education was stressed to him at a young age. He graduated high school when he was only 16, and then after completing his bachelor's degree, he earned a medical degree from the University of Copenhagen in 1890. He was able to work as a medical resident while also working as an assistant to different faculty members at the university, and this allowed him to stay up to date with the growing field of medical bacteriology. The medical field was rapidly accepting the germ theory of disease, which was supported by scientists Robert Koch in Germany and Louis Pasteur in France. Koch and Pasteur had set up research institutions in their respective countries, and both were making big discoveries relating to microorganisms and their ability to cause disease. In 1891, Fibiger went on a study abroad tour to Berlin, where he was able to work with both Koch and the future Nobel Prize winning scientist Emil von Behring. This connection with Behring became very important just a few years later. The year before Fibiger's arrival in Berlin, Behring had demonstrated the effectiveness of serum therapy as a treatment for diphtheria disease. That discovery would lead Bering to be awarded the first Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1901. Bering's discovery that the serum therapy could be used to combat diphtheria was big news all over the Western world, including in Fibiger's home country of Denmark. In 1895, Denmark began producing its own serum for use against diphtheria, but there was some skepticism regarding the effectiveness of the treatment. Fibiger addressed these concerns by carrying out one of the first examples of a randomized controlled clinical trial. Patients who came to the hospital were randomly sorted by Fibiger into one of two groups. One group got serum therapy, and the other group got standard care. The results of Fibiger's clinical trial showed a four-fold decrease in mortality among people who got the serum compared to people who did not. This confirmed the effectiveness of the treatment and helped establish Fibiger as a scientific researcher. In 1900, he was appointed Professor of Pathological Anatomy at Copenhagen University and Director of the Institute of Pathological Anatomy. He continued working on microbial diseases, particularly tuberculosis, but eventually his research shifted into the experimental study of cancer. So what was known about cancer back in Fibiger's day? Well, people have known about cancer since ancient times. The first description of breast cancer dates to ancient Egypt about 4,000 years ago, along with the words, no known treatment. That phrase, no known treatment, remained the same for centuries. In the 18th century, with the development of microscopy, people were able to observe cancer cells under the microscope. It became clear 
that cancers are diseases of our own body, our own body turning against itself. There are many different types of cancer, but all are characterized by cells undergoing uncontrolled growth. These cells spread out and invade other parts of the body, and cancer cells then crowd out and inhibit healthy cells, which eventually prevents the healthy cells from doing their job, resulting in organ failure and eventually death. The advancement of anesthesia and antiseptics in the second half of the 19th century allowed for painless operations to be performed under sterile conditions, this led to the golden age of cancer surgery, where doctors hoped to remove the tumors before they spread to other parts of the body. Now, while surgery was emerging as a possible way to treat cancer, scientists still knew very little about what caused cancer. There were many theories, but there was little experimental evidence for what caused cancers. The study of cancer was limited to the study of cancer tumors that were found naturally. Scientists could take cancer tumors and implant them into animals, after which the tumors would grow and spread. This allowed scientists to study metastasis, the process by which cancer cells spread throughout the body. But scientists didn't have a way to generate new cancers in the lab. This meant they couldn't study carcinogenesis. What's carcinogenesis? Carcinogenesis is the process by which a normal cell becomes a cancer cell. Now, Fibiger's reported discovery in, and the 1926 Nobel Prize was exciting because, if correct, it would allow researchers to generate cancer cells in the lab. Now, Fibiger entered the field of cancer research almost accidentally, or as I like to say, serendipitously. In 1907, he was collecting wild rats as part of a study on tuberculosis. However, three of the rats he dissected were shown not to be suffering from tuberculosis, but from a stomach infection with a particular parasitic worm. Additionally, the rats had developed papillomas, or little bumps, little tumors, in their stomachs. Fibiger observed that the worms had invaded the tumors. He wanted to study the relationship between these worms found in the tumors and the rats, so he collected more rats, caught from locations around Copenhagen, and from one particular location, a sugar refinery, he found that 18 rats out of 61 showed some signs of tumor growth, and this was strongly correlated with the presence of the roundworms. Now, this wasn't enough to say that the worms were causing the tumors. Fibiger knew correlation does not equal causation. So, to show causation, Fibiger took the worms back to the lab and fed the worms to his laboratory rats. Half of the rats in the lab developed stomach tumors. Now Fibiger thinks he has something, right? The rats didn't have tumors before they were infected with the worm, but after they were infected, the rats had tumors. Pretty cool. The next thing Fibiger wanted to know was, were the tumors cancerous? It's important to know there's a difference between benign tumors and cancerous tumors, also called malignant tumors. This difference would become the main issue around Fibiger's discovery. Both benign and malignant tumors are abnormal growths of cells, and they can appear very similar under the microscope, though they will appear different from healthy cells. The difference, though, between benign and malignant tumors is metastasis. Metastasis is the ability of tumor cells to leave their initial site of development and spread to other parts of the body and form new tumors. Metastasis is a feature specifically of malignant tumors, not benign tumors. Because of their inability to metastasize, benign tumors are generally not as serious as malignant tumors, though they sometimes can develop into malignant tumors. So Fibiger wanted to know what kind of tumor is in the rats, benign or malignant. To determine if the tumors were cancerous, Fibiger looked at them under the microscope. Looking at the morphology or shape of the cells, he claimed to have found both benign and cancerous tumors in the rats, though most of the tumors were benign. Among the 111 rats that developed tumors, 
19 of them had tumors that looked to Fibiger like cancer. He took photographs of the tumors for his report, and in a couple of the rats, he even claimed to have detected metastasis of the tumors to other organs outside the stomach, which would make them true cancers. Fibiger published his findings in 1913, and his paper received a lot of attention. The discovery that a parasite could cause cancer, if it were true, had two important implications. First, it opened the possibility that human cancers might also be caused by microbial infections. The, t the beginning part of the 20th century was the golden age of medical microbiology. Scientists were identifying microorganisms as the cause of numerous human diseases, so why not cancer as well? Secondly, Fibiger's discovery, if it were true, would allow researchers to experimentally generate cancerous tumors in the laboratory, which would allow them to study carcinogenesis. If it was true that the worms caused cancer. While Fibiger's Danish colleagues excitedly accepted his results, others were not so easily convinced. In 1917, a paper was published by two American scientists that challenged Fibiger's findings. These scientists were not convinced by Fibiger's images that the tumors he observed were really cancerous. Furthermore, they believed the reason the rats developed the tumors was because the worms irritated the stomach tissue. They hypothesized that there wasn't anything special about the worms that caused the tumors and that the tumors could be produced simply by irritating the stomach with either chemicals or sharp objects. They tested their hypothesis in rats, and the rats that received the irritants developed tumors similar to the ones in Fibiger's photographs. The authors published their findings along with their criticisms of Fibiger's paper. Their chief criticism was that the tumors they observed in their rats were not cancerous. They also noted that Fibiger had been unsuccessful in transferring his tumors from one rat to another, a property that would have proved them to be truly cancerous. They also noted that Fibiger had been unsuccessful in producing the tumors in wild rats or in mice. And finally, they suggested that the photographs of the tumors Fibiger had published could be benign tumors rather than true cancer cells. Fibiger published a reply to the criticism in 1919 in which he defended his findings and stood by his claim that the tumors really were cancerous, though he admitted to some of the limitations of his results and their inconsistencies with the Americans' results. Following Fibiger's rebuttal, it became generally accepted that Fibiger had discovered a way to produce cancer in rats. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize multiple times, more on that in a minute, eventually winning the 1926 prize in physiology or medicine. Ironically, he died of stomach cancer only a few months after his acceptance of the prize, so he was never able to defend his results from the eventual criticism they received. Now, that criticism was kind of a long time coming. People continued to try to replicate Fibiger's results, but it proved difficult to achieve what he said he'd observed. It wasn't until 1935 that a paper was published that offered a clue. The paper showed that rats kept on a healthy diet did not develop tumors when fed the worms. On the other hand, rats that were fed a diet deficient in vitamin A showed signs of stomach tumors that became especially pronounced in the presence of the worms. Importantly, all the tumors observed in the vitamin A deficient mice were benign and no cancerous tumors were ever observed. Now Fibiger had fed his mice a diet of white bread which did not contain vitamin A. So these new results raised the possibility that Fibiger's rats got tumors because they were malnourished, not because they had the worms. In the early 1950s, Two American scientists named Hitchcock and Bell set out to determine once and for all if Fibiger's results had been due to vitamin A deficiency. Using various combinations of worms and a vitamin A deficient diet, they showed that the rats given the worms developed tumors only when kept on a diet deficient in vitamin A, and importantly, the tumors that developed were all benign. 
Furthermore, the authors compared their benign tumors to the photographs Fibiger had taken and concluded that what Fibiger had taken for cancerous tumors were really advanced benign tumors. Though still unusual in appearance, the tumors Fibiger saw were not cancerous. So let's go back and reconstruct Fibiger's experiments from the beginning. He finds some rats that have stomach tumors and that are also infected with a parasitic worm. He hypothesizes that there might be a connection between the tumors and the worms. He looks for more cases of the worms and the tumors and eventually finds some rats from a sugar refinery that have both the parasites and the tumors. Now we can assume with hindsight that these rats were likely vitamin A deficient, living on a diet of processed sugar, which led them to develop the stomach tumors when they were infected. Fibiger, however, thinks the tumors are caused by the worms, so he takes the worms back to his lab. He feeds the worms to his lab rats, which are also vitamin A deficient because of their diet of white bread, and lo and behold, the rats develop tumors. Fibiger checks the appearance of these tumors under the microscope. While most of the tumors appear benign, some of them look different from the surrounding tumors, and he concludes they must be cancer. However, he is unable to transfer the tumors from one rat to another like a true cancer, and wild rats given the worms never develop tumors. Nonetheless, his results are accepted by the scientific community, and he is eventually awarded the Nobel Prize. It's accepted today that Fibiger was mistaken about the nature of the tumors he observed. He has a bad rap for this, but it should be noted that he wasn't committing research fraud or deliberately trying to deceive people. He simply mistook the nature of the tumors that he saw, and given how little was known about cancer over a hundred years ago, we can't blame him too much for his mistake. However, a lot of criticism has been leveled at the Karolinska Institute for their decision to give the Nobel Prize for a discovery that later proved to be false. What makes the story even more embarrassing is that Fibiker was not the only cancer scientist nominated for the 1926 Nobel Prize. The Nobel Committee had considered awarding the prize jointly to Fibiger and to the Japanese scientist Yamagiwa Katsusaburu. Yamagiwa and his colleagues had shown that it was possible to produce cancerous tumors in rodents by applying tar coal to their skin. Unlike Fibiger's case, the tar coal experiments were readily reproduced by other labs, and because it was so much easier to get a can of tar coal than Fibiger's worms, the tar coal method quickly became more popular and has had a much bigger impact on the field of cancer research. Many have therefore criticized the Karolinska Institute's decision to not award Yamagiwa the award, especially since their decision may have been influenced in part by the fact that Yamagiwa lived thousands of miles away from the European-dominated scientific scene. Now, even though Fibiger's discovery did not lead to any breakthroughs in the field of cancer research, his story can teach us some things about the nature of scientific experimentation. So there are two important lessons I get from Fibiger's story. Lesson number one, what happens in the lab does not always represent what happens outside the lab. The diet of white bread Fibiger gave his lab rats made them vitamin A deficient. Wild rats don't live off a diet of white bread, so Fibiger's experiments did not accurately represent what happens in the real world outside his lab. He missed the discrepancy between the lab rats and the wild rats, and it led him to make a false conclusion. Now, these discrepancies happen all the time in science. As scientists, we take complicated systems, and in order to make studying them easier, we simplify them down into models that are easy to manipulate and work with. In biology, this usually means studying a human disease in an animal model like mice or rats. The mice and rats are much easier to work with and to do experiments on, but you have to admit that a mouse in a lab is very different from a human. So while sometimes the discoveries made in mice do mimic what happens in humans, sometimes they don't, because humans are very different from mice. <laughs> Unfortunately, the media often overlooks this basic fact of laboratory research. You'll regularly see headlines about how 
scientists make breakthrough discovery that will change the world as we know it. And most of those headlines are based off results someone got in a model system. Results that have not been demonstrated yet in the system that model represents. A huge part of doing laboratory research is finding the best model for the system one is studying, and researchers are constantly trying to improve the models that we work with so they better mimic what happens in the real world outside the lab. The more we do these improvements, the more likely we are to avoid the kind of error made by Fibiger. Lesson number two I get from Fibiger's story, reproducibility is a crucial part of science. One of the things I love about science is that it deals with objective reality. By that, I mean that science deals with realities that are present no matter who observes them. That means I can run an experiment in the lab and get a certain result, and I can expect that if you or if anyone else ran that same experiment, you would get the same result as me. There are a few exceptions to that in particle physics, but generally that rule holds. <laughs> so we call this property of science reproducibility, and the best scientific claims are the ones that are reproducible. Repeating someone else's experiment can help establish the validity of that experiment and also lends confidence to the theory that experiment supports. Alternatively, reproducing an experiment can help identify experimental errors and false theories and ideas, like the false idea that the MMR vaccine causes autism. Fibiger's results were disproved when other people tried to reproduce his experiments and failed to get cancer cells. In the weight of all the evidence brought forth by scientists over decades regarding Fibiger's results, we can now safely say that Fibiger made a mistake. Even though it kind of sucks for Fibiger that he was wrong, I'm encouraged by his story because it shows the self-correcting power of the scientific method. Big objective claims in science, like Fibiger's, need to be put through the gauntlet of reproducibility testing. Putting big claims under that kind of scrutiny is what helps us better understand the world around us and helps us sort out the truth. So that concludes this sixth episode of Notable Nobels. This episode was recorded on January 21st, 2021. I want to thank Digital Mind Productions for providing the music. Next time on Notable Nobels, the Nobel laureate we will be discussing one day wondered to himself, what's the connection between taking a bath and stopping a deadly epidemic? How did he answer that question? Well, listen next time to find out. Thanks so much for listening. See you then.